What's up guys and gals, it's CJ here, your Vegas Insider, and we are back to doing college basketball previews for the 2019-2020 college basketball season. Uh, I've been away for about a week, I actually had to go out of town, back to California for a few days, and I've been really busy researching and getting my final future bets in for college basketball before the season starts. Uh, the season's right around the corner. Uh, as of the day of this filming, it's actually Halloween, October 31st today. Uh, we're about a week away from the season beginning. Uh, teams are playing their uh, some of their final exhibition games now. Uh, like I said, the regular season starts in about a week. So uh, one thing I've said in previous videos is that in order to find value on the future line, you really have to, you make most of your money before the season even starts. Once the season gets going and once it's obvious who looks good and who doesn't, uh, Vegas adjusts their future lines accordingly. So, for instance, you know, last year with a team like Texas Tech, who I'm sporting the hoodie today, uh, in the beginning of the season, you could have got 200 to 1. Uh, but, you know, by the time the tournament started, they were down to like 20 to 1. So, you know, if you can see what's coming, if you can see how good a team looks before they actually start playing, there's a lot of more money to be made before the season actually starts. So anyway, I've been really busy betting futures. I, I haven't really had time to make videos the last week or so, but I'm going to go ahead and pound them out here. Uh, I, I've only gotten a number 23 on my preview, so what I'm going to do is take them three or four at a time now. Instead of doing one team and talking about them for about 25 minutes, I'm going to do about like three or four teams in a 25-minute video so I could get these knocked out by the time the season starts. All right, so coming in at number 22 today, we have Texas Tech. I know that that's quite a bit lower than where, where you will see Texas Tech on most uh, so-called experts' uh, rankings, preseason rankings. Uh, I have the hoodie because, uh, not necessarily because I've been a huge Texas Tech fan all my life or I'm from Lubbock. In fact, I have no idea where Lubbock even is. I just know it's, I think it's somewhere in West Texas. I've never been there personally. But uh, like I said in my intro video, when I have a lot of money on a future, on a team, uh, I tend to buy the hoodie either on eBay or from the school uh, website just because, uh, you know, it's a, I'm, I'm a fan of that team for that season. So if you go back and look at my top 25 preview, uh, 23 we did Florida State, 24 was Harvard, and 25 was Vermont. If you look at the Vermont preview, I'm actually sporting a Vermont hoodie. That's because I took a ton of Vermont this season at 2,000 to 1 futures headed into the season. You can't get that high of a number now. Their odds are actually dropping pretty fast as the season's approaching. So if you paid attention to that video, hopefully you got that 1,000 to 1 you could still get on Vermont. Some places are dropping them as low as 500 to 1, 300 to 1. It seems that Vegas is catching on that Vermont's going to be pretty good this year. But anyway, I'm sporting a Vermont hoodie in that video because after I got all this 2,000 to 1, I went on eBay and bought the hoodie because I'm a huge Catamounts fan this year. Uh, as far as who my favorite team is, I'm just a fan of college basketball. It's my favorite sport. College football is my second favorite sport. They're the only two sports I follow. I'm just a huge fan of the sport in general. As a kid growing up, I was a big UNLV fan. I live in Vegas now, so I'll always love the Rebels. Uh, Tarkanian, those Tarkanian teams of the 80s and 90s were my favorites of all time. But other than that, I really don't necessarily have a favorite team. It's whoever I have a lot of money on that year is my favorite team. So, why do I have the Texas Tech hoodie? I've been very big on Texas Tech the last two years. Uh, last season, I had an 80 to 1 future on Texas Tech. I missed the 200 to 1 future by about an hour. Uh, it's so crazy. If you go on Google and look up Texas Tech future bet 200 to 1, you're going to see a ticket from the Westgate that a guy, he bet $1,500 to win $300,000 on Texas Tech. He bet $1,500 at 200 to 1. Uh, my brother who lives in Vegas, I have a slightly older brother. He lives here in town in Vegas. He's lived here for many years. And he bets futures year, year, in, you know, year round just like I do. My brother had the same bet. Now, that, that ticket that you'll see on Google that you can find a snapshot of, that's not his ticket. 
At least I don't think it is, so unless he's keeping a secret from me. But he had that exact same bet at Westgate. I just think he had it for, for a lower amount. And he told me that Texas Tech was 200 to 1 last year. And so I looked it up. I saw that it was 200 to 1. But I didn't have any money in my mobile account at that time, which is a lesson I learned. Every year, the more I do this year in and year out, I learn more and more lessons. And the lesson I learned from last year was always have money in your mobile account if you do this seriously like I do. Because I didn't have any money in my mobile app, I couldn't bet the line late at night. So I had to go there the next morning at 9 a.m. when they opened and put money in my account and then bet it. But they had just moved it a half an hour before they actually opened. They moved it about 8.30 in the morning. They opened to the public at 9. So I got 80 to 1 on Texas Tech, which ended up making me money because they made the title game. I hedged big on Virginia, even though I didn't have a single future on Virginia last year. I won money because that 80 to, 80 to 1 was juicy enough for me during the title game to put on a bunch of hedges, to play first half, to play second half, to do in plays, which I'll explain all of that to you as we get into March, as we get in to the tournament, and I can actually teach you how you can make money hedging, middling, using in plays, things like that, uh, if you're interested in making money off this channel. But so anyway, I made money off of at 80 to 1. Had I had just bet it the night before at 200 to 1, I would have made a lot more money. So that was a blown opportunity for me. But I was a huge Texas Tech fan last year. I was an even bigger fan the year before. I had a 500 to 1 future at Golden Nugget the year before when they made the Elite Eight and lost to eventual champ Villanova. So the last two seasons, Texas Tech has made deep runs in the tournament. Both seasons they lost to the eventual national champ in the Elite Eight to Villanova two years ago, and in the title game to Virginia last season. So I've been a big fan the last two years. That's why I have the hoodie. Now, here's the bad news for you Texas Tech fans who are watching this video. I'm not high on your team at all this year. Uh, I'm actually much lower. Most prognosticators have them around the 10 to 15-ish level. I have them here at 22, and I'm going to be honest with you. The only reason I have them this high is because of Chris Beard. And because of how good they've been the last two years, obviously the system works. Obviously the system is in place and it's well defined and they're always going to be a good defensive team and he gets the most out of his roster. But that being said, I'm not high on this team whatsoever. I think they're way too small for the conference they're in. The Big 12 is actually the toughest conference at the bottom, meaning that there are no... There are no bad teams in the Big 12. Hell, I even think TCU, who everybody has at the bottom of the Big 12, I think TCU and Kansas State, they have, you know, excellent coaches, and they're both good teams. It, it kind of worries me that Texas Tech uh, is in this conference because they actually have a pretty small roster. So let, if you look at what they lost from last season to this season, they lost an elite Rim protector, shot blocker, and Tariq Owens, a 6'11", you know, power forward center type who could jump out of the gym and swat shots. Uh, he was basically the center. The power forward was Odiasi, who was like a 6'9", 250-pound roadblock in the middle. He defined his space in the paint. He was like that immovable object in the paint. Did all the dirty work. Um, he definitely had a presence and a force down low. Those two really set the groundwork for their defense. And then Jared Culver, who was the leading scorer and option one on the offensive end and was a lottery pick, he was also a tremendous defender as well out on the wing with his 6'6 six six, six length and his long arms, his wingspan. He was, a, he was an elite level defender. So I'm very concerned about Texas Tech because of what they lost on the defensive end. Not even to mention the offensive end with Mooney and Culver. I just think that, I, I, don't get me wrong, Beard is doing a tremendous job. And he's already defined the program and built the program. But they don't recruit at a level to like a Duke or a Kentucky or even a Kansas where they can just pretty much reload or even a Michigan State for that matter. They have a, ter they have a terrific freshman in Jamias Ramsey coming in, 
but they just don't have enough coming in to reload what they lost. Now, I understand they're pulling from the transfer market. So they're losing Owens and Odiasi. They're getting Chris Clark from Virginia Tech, and they're getting TJ Holyfield from Stephen F. Austin. I just don't think these two down low are, are even going to be close to what Odiasi and Owens gave them, especially on the defensive end. They might even be better on the offensive end, uh, but nowhere close to what they gave them on the defensive end. And, the, and what I was saying earlier about the Big 12, even the bad teams, or there are no bad teams, but even the teams picked near the bottom, your Oklahomas, your Kansas States, your uh, TCUs, they have big players down low, especially TCU with Kevin Samuel, who I think can be a big breakout star in his sophomore season. He's like a 6'11 behemoth, weighs like 265, 270. He is going to eat TJ Holyfield and Chris Clark alive down low, just as an example. And they're predicted to be the 10th place team in the conference. And there's only 10 teams, even though it's still called the Big 12, which is absolutely ridiculous. Now, the backcourt is strong. I, I don't want to make it sound like I think they're going to be a bad team or anything like that. They, they have a really, really good backcourt. They'll run three guards with Davide Moretti, uh, Kyler Edwards, and Jamias Ramsey. Now, that is one of the best backcourts in the Big 12. That backcourt, along with Kansas, will be the two best backcourts in the Big 12. The problem is, Edwards was a, a freshman last year, and now he's got to really step up. He's going to be expected to make that freshman to sophomore leap, and instead of being a role player, he's going to have to come in and be you know, one of the go-to scorers on this team. We'll see if he can do that. He's a 6'4 sophomore guard. Jemias Ramsey has the most upside of anybody on this roster. He's a 6'4 freshman, though, so he'll kind of be the wing. He'll be the three spot. Um, we'll see. We'll see if those two can play at an elite level uh, consistently throughout the year. I think Moretti's a solid point guard. But he's not a he's a six three point guard who's a good three point shooter. He doesn't turn the ball over. He's an outstanding uh, ninety percent plus free throw shooter. So he's a solid point guard. But he's not going to break you down off the dribble or attack the rim. And you don't have to worry about him getting into the lane and dunking on people. He's not that. He's not going to do what Cole Anthony's going to do this year at North Carolina. If anybody from the backcourt is going to do that, it's going to be Ramsey. But. Like I said, it's a solid backcourt, um, but I, I'm just so worried about the front court. I'm worried about the overall size. So let's talk about the starting five. They go one through five, six three, six four, six four, six six, six eight. I think that's incredibly small for the Big Twelve. Now Houston got away with running a small lineup, and we're going to talk about Houston coming up soon here. Houston got away with running small, and they actually were a, one of the best rebounding teams in the country, which is unbelievable considering how small they were. I don't think it's going to work for Texas Tech. Um, they don't play in the AAC, and that's not a knock on the AAC. I think the AAC is going to be a strong conference this year, but it's nowhere near the Big 12, night in and night out, top to bottom. The Big 12 is a true round robin where you have to play every team twice, that means they're playing nine tough road games this season, not to mention all the tough games you got to win at home. So with Texas Tech, I see them losing quite a few games this season. I can see them being a good team, but finishing like 23 and 10 or, you know, 24 and 9 type of season. That's kind of what I think's in store for this team. And my videos are predictive. My rankings are always predictive. I don't necessarily rank the 25 best teams, 25 to 1. I kind of rank them based on their schedule, based on who they play, how strong their record's going to be, and how good they are, and their roster, and where I think they'll finish in the polls. I, I just think this is going to be a year in the Big 12 where second place is 11 and 7 or worse. Like, I have Kansas firmly in first probably 14 and 4, no worse than 13 and 5, but I think 11 and 7 is second place. And I don't think anybody else gets to 12 wins in the Big 12. There's just too much parity. It's too tough on a night in night out basis. And so I don't expect Texas Tech to be like, you know, 24 and 6 or 
or whatever, you know, 25 and 7, whatever they were the last couple years, I definitely see them taking a step back. And instead of a two or a three seed in the tournament, I see them more, I definitely see them more as like a six, a five, six, seven in that range, even though they could still come in second or third place in the Big 12. The Big 12 is just, it, it's a gauntlet of a conference. It's a meat grinder, and it really is this year because there are literally no bad teams. West Virginia was your last place team. They're going to be much better this year. And they, they have a huge front court. They're a team that's going to give Texas Tech a ton of trouble with uh, Oscar uh, Shwebwe, or I, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but he's the top, like, top 40-ish, 6'9", 250. He's the highest recruit West Virginia's ever had. You know, a, a monster 6'9", power forward. And they have Derek Culver coming back from last year, another 6'10", power forward, rim protector type. Texas Tech, they could get murdered by a front court like West Virginia has. And West Virginia was your last place finisher in the conference this year. So anyway, uh, I think I pretty much said enough about Texas Tech. Their, their best possible odds you could find right now are 50 to 1 at Circa. I would absolutely stay away. I think there's no value at 50 to 1. Like I said, I had them at 80 to 1 last year. They made me a lot of money by reaching the title game. I had them at 500 to 1 two years ago. They made the Elite Eight. Uh, they, they were terrific values the last couple years. But being that they made the title game, um, the, in my opinion, they're just overrated this year coming into the season. I know a lot of people love them, and a lot of people have them ranked 10th or 8th or 11th. I just don't see it. And and this is one of those things where you'll see. I mean, nobody else has Vermont ranked, but I do. Nobody else has Texas Tech this low, but I do. So you we'll look back at this in a couple months and we'll see if I know what I'm talking about. But I feel pretty comfortable in saying that I mean I love Chris Beard. I love the program. I love the system. But I think Texas Tech is headed for a step back in just a brutal conference top to bottom. Number 21. Washington. If I was just ranking this team based on what I think they are right now or when the season starts a week from now, I would probably not have Washington ranked. And like I've said a million times and you'll probably get sick of hearing me say it, my videos are all about predictive, what I see coming down the road because it's the only way I know how to rank teams because I'm always, I live in Vegas, I bet college football, college basketball full-time, so I can only look at it with, with the mindset of where can I see value where other people don't see it, or where do I see an overrated team where everybody else is in love with it for whatever reason. So Washington is a team that I can see them struggling in the beginning of the season because they're incorporating so many new pieces into the roster. They lost four starters and their point guard isn't even eligible to play until uh, end of December or beginning of January, whenever the second, second semester starts. So, and with all, with the freshmen coming in, it's going to take a minute for Hopkins to get the pieces to gel, especially playing a complex two, three zone. It's going to take a minute for this team to get good. But I think once Quaddy Green is playing for them, and once the freshmen, um, Jaden McDaniels and Isaiah Stewart, the two forwards, once they have some ex game experience under their belt, come conference uh, uh, play in January, this is going to transform into a very dangerous team. So let's talk about what Washington has coming in. They're kind of like Duke or Kentucky light in terms of recruiting. They have some serious recruiting talent on this roster. Uh, quick trivia question. Who's the only team this season in college basketball who has two of the top eight recruits on the same team? I'll give you a hint. It's not Duke and it's not Kentucky. Yeah, you guessed it. It's Washington, the team I'm talking about right now. They have the number three and the number eight overall recruit from the 2019 recruiting class. Uh, not even Memphis has two top eight recruits. And like I said, not even Duke or Kentucky have that this season. So there's some serious, um, there's some serious star power on this roster. Isaiah Stewart is the number three overall recruit. He's 6'9", 245. And from everything I hear, the guy is just an incredible rebounder, intimidating presence down low. You pair him with Jaden McDaniels, who's, 
you know, he's 6'9", but only weighs 180. He's like more like the long, lengthy, can jump out the gym type. Uh, a perfect complement to the... It's kind of like what I was talking about Texas Tech last year. McDaniels is more like Tariq Owens, you know, the lengthy, athletic, you know, guy who can jump out the gym. And then, and then Stewart is like Odiasi, like the rock who intimidates and carves out his space down low. I think it makes for a good pair for Washington. The problem is they're both true freshmen. So like I said, it, it, it could take some time. Like the finished product in, in January, February, March is going to be much better than what we see to start the season. Also, like I said, Quade Green, another five-star class of two, seven, 2017 point guard. Uh, he was recruited by Kentucky. So he left Kentucky sat out most of last season, but he's been in the system with Hopkins at, at UW. So he's familiar with the system. It's just a matter of when the NCAA finally allows him to play. They're trying to get a waiver to get him to play from the start of the season, but we're only a week away and the NCAA hasn't granted that for him yet. So he may not be playing until, you know, end of December, beginning of January. But once he comes in, now, he's been practicing for over a year with the team now, or about a year with the team now. So he'll hit the ground running. I think he'll be just fine when he comes in. It gives him a true point guard, another five-star, and he's actually a junior. So, you know, he's matured and become a man. He's not just a kid anymore. And, uh, it, you know, throw in Nas Carter, who could have a huge breakout season, I think he should be the, the two guard. He would be a 6'6 two guard. If you slide Hamir right to the wing, put him at the three at 6'8", uh, you would have, you'd be going 6'1", 6'6", 6'8", 6'9", and 6'9". And with three juniors and two freshmen. Now in college basketball, if you have four and five star guys, three juniors and two freshmen is actually a pretty experienced squad. So I think Washington will be fine once Quaddy Green is able to play. And then the ceiling becomes very high because now you're talking all four and five star guys, very athletic, very long in that zone. They actually, if Carter can move to the two and right place the three with McDaniels and Stewart as the four and five, you're talking about a longer team than you had last year. Uh, probably more athletic too. And then you have solid guys off the bench like uh, Raekwon Battle. He's another four-star recruit that came in this year. Uh, he was number 80 overall, 6'4 shooting guard. So you got the number three, the number eight, and the number 80 players in this class all on the same team. It's an incredible job that uh, Hopkins has done in a couple years. He's really transforming that program. His first season, he increased the win total. They, you know, they didn't make the tournament but they got 20 wins. Then last year they make the tournament. They win a game before running into number one seed uh, Washington. They beat a really good Utah State team in, in the first game of the NCAA tournament. And now this year he's got his guys in and he's got some serious four and five star level talent there. Uh, just want to talk about a couple more guys coming in off the bench. You have Brian Penn Johnson and Nate Roberts, a couple seven-footers that Hopkins recruited last year. They both redshirted, so they've been in the system for over a year. Um, the, the, they'll come in off the bench. They give a lot of size to this team, along with Sam Timmons, who's been there. He'll be a senior this year. He's played for three years. Uh, another 6'10", big dude. So, I mean, this team has a lot of size, a lot of athleticism. Their biggest problem last year was rebounding margin. Washington was minus 3.3 per game in the rebounding department, and that's a big problem. That ranked 305th out of 353 Division I teams. It ranked 11th in the Pac-12. But I think this team is going to rebound better. I think Isaiah Stewart is just going to gobble up glass like crazy. Um, he's going to be a tremendous rebounder. Uh, with Wright at 6'8", playing the wing, and Carter, if he's in the backcourt at 6'6", I think they have plenty of length and athleticism to get loose balls, to, to get rebounds, even, even though it is tougher to rebound out of a zone than when you're man-to-man -man and you can just body up a guy a lot easier. I, I think this team will be okay in the rebounding department. I think they at least go from minus 3.3 to even, which would be a big improvement. So I think the real question mark with this team this season, I think they'll be improved on the rebounding end. I think... The real question is going to be three-point shooting. They weren't a great three-point shooting team last season, 
and they lost Jalen Noel, who was actually 44%. He was a great three-point shooter. And they lost David Crisp, who I think was around 37 or 38%, if I remember right. They were strong three-point shooters, and they're gone. So, and overall, they were a bad three-point shooting team. So, somebody's going to have to step up and knock down the three ball to stretch the defense and allow the floor to be spaced for the offense. And without Quaddy Green in the beginning, I think this team can really struggle from the offensive end. So, this, this prediction may look bad when the season starts. I think there'll be a decent defensive team that gets better as the young pieces get more experience. I think they'll be a good defensive team by the end of the season. If they rebound better and if they find a three-point shooter, those are the major issues this team needs to address. But if they're solid in those areas and once Green is playing with them, they could, they could easily contend for the Pac-12 title. So for now, we have Washington at number 21. Number 20, the University of Houston. Oh, man, this was one of my favorite teams last year, as well as Texas Tech. I was very high on Texas Tech. It made me money. I was very high on Houston, and darn it, they almost made me money. I had a lot of futures on Houston last year, around the 250-1, to 300-1 to level before the season started. Uh, even as the season went on and they were compiling a monster record, they actually finished 33-4. and four. Uh, that was their final record last season. But I think at one point they were like 20 and 1 or 21 and 1 at some point last year. And I remember I still bet them at like 125 to 1. I couldn't believe, I think Caesars or someone had them at like, still had them at like 125 to 1. I had a lot on this team. And they were really, really good. It's just, they made the Sweet 16. It's unfortunate that they ran into, you know, a loaded Kentucky team. Kentucky's always loaded with a Hall of Fame coach. They're always going to be a tough team to beat. The game was basically a coin flip. It was tied in the last minute. It was just, you know, it went down to the final minute. And Tyler Hero hit a huge shot, and Kentucky won the game. But it could have went either way. And if Houston wins that game, they're in the Elite Eight, and I think they would have beat Auburn. I think the way they defend, I mean, of course, it's purely speculation. Who knows? Anything could have happened. Point is, they did lose to Kentucky. But I'm saying if they had beaten Kentucky, I would have bet them or, or favored them to beat Auburn the next game. So I kind of feel like I was very close on hitting a big payday with Houston. And uh, I really like this team this year, too. Um, like I said, I, I'm not very high on Texas Tech. I'm not very high on Washington right now. I would lay off. In case I didn't say it about Washington, stay away from the 100 to 1 future. That's the highest number. Uh, just let me backtrack a little. The highest number in town is 100 to 1. Most places on Washington have like 60 to 1, 80 to 1. But I would stay away for now. Let's see if that number gets raised. I'll let you know if it does. And I think at a higher level, uh, I would be very happy to jump on Washington. But for now, that's a stay away. But not all 100 to 1 teams are built the same. Uh, Houston is a, the highest on Houston this year is also 100 to 1. So you have three teams Florida State, Houston, Washington, where the n highest number in town ha just happens to be 100 to 1 on all three of those teams. And that's the highest number. Most books don't even have them that high. But I do all the work for you. I have every single sports app on my phone, I check them every day to get the best value, the best price. You have to do that if you want to make money betting futures. Not all 100 to 1 teams are built the same, even though I have them grouped very similar. I have Houston at 20, Washington at 21, Florida State at 23. The difference is Houston's going to be better right away than Florida State and Washington because of all the new pieces those teams have. I think we'll catch better odds later. Even though Houston lost their entire backcourt, they're replacing it with guys who played key minutes last season uh, with proven players. So Houston runs three guards. They run two guards and kind of a wing player who's basically another guard. And then they run two forwards. And typically they're, they play small ball. They're a small, athletic, 
tough defensive team that takes charges, they cut off spacing, they they get in your face the entire game, but they're not a very big team. They're kind of one of these positionless uh, athletic teams, and you, usually the biggest player on the floor for Houston goes 6'8". He was, last year, Bray on Brady was a 6'8 power forward type. He's the only front court player Houston loses from last season. Uh, the front court's all coming back with a couple new pieces, which I'll talk about in a second. So I think the front court's actually stronger than last season. The turnover is in the back court, but I would jump on the 100 to 1 now on Houston because even though the back court's turning over, the players who are taking over have a lot of game experience. They're very high level recruits, and I don't think they're going to struggle at all. I think Houston's going to come right out of the gate playing well. And yet again, this is another example of a team I have ranked, which none of the so called experts have ranked. If you look at any website, you know, any of the major network websites or college basketball websites, Sports Illustrated, any sporting website, none of their college basketball experts have Houston in their top 25. Uh, to me, I think it's crazy. I may even be too low on this team because once, and I wouldn't have had them ranked either until Quentin Grimes got the waiver to play immediately. I think they have one of the best backcourts in the country. The problem is the average fan doesn't really know who Dejan Giroux and Nate Hinton are, but I think they make up a fantastic guard duo. You throw in the number 10 overall recruit from last year, according to 24-7. 24-7 is who I use for who I trust with my recruit rankings. I think they do a fantastic job. Quentin Grimes was ranked number 10 overall last year in the country by 24-7. Now, he showed flashes of brilliance. He was very inconsistent at Kansas. I just don't think he was happy there. I don't think the system fit him. I think he wanted to be on ball a little more, but the problem is they have a really you know uh, outstanding point guard in Devin Dotson who... I mean, he wasn't always outstanding last season because he was a true freshman, just like Grimes, but he has the potential to be outstanding. And we'll get to Kansas much later in, in the previews, but I can't blame Bill Self for letting Dotson, you know, primarily run the point and keeping Grimes more off the ball. But it seemed like Grimes wasn't comfortable. He wanted the ball in his hands more. So he had a very up and down year, but, you know, he showed you flashes of what he can be and I think he realizes now like ultimately his dream is to go to the NBA I mean when you're when you're the number 10 overall recruit on a five star you your your goal is the NBA so I think Qu Quentin Grimes is going to do whatever he has to do to show NBA scouts he's ready to take the, the step next season I would be very shocked if he played another year in college after this so I think he's going to find a way to fit in with Houston. Um, he's very fortunate that he got this waiver to play. He's playing on a very good team and he's playing with elite level athletes in the backcourt with him. Uh, don't sleep on this Houston team this year. This team is no joke. The three guard tandem of uh, Dejan Giroux at the point, Nate Hinton at the two and Grimes or, or maybe Grimes at the two, Hinton at the three, either way. Um, they're all big enough to play that three or two. Uh, you, you know, any of the guards could play the two. Any of the guards could play the wing. They're, they're tall enough. All three of these guys are six foot five. I think you'll see Grimes handle the ball when Giroux has to sit, when he's taking rest, or if he were to get into foul trouble, whatever. I really like the pieces in the backcourt. I, I honestly think this is one of the best backcourts in the country. Dejon Giroux was a top 50 recruit in the 2016 class. So he's matured. He's been around for a few years now. Um, Nate Hinton was a four-star recruit, number 105 overall uh, last year. And like I said, Grimes, number 10 overall, five-star last year. So you're, you're talking about a five-star and two four-stars. But Dejon Giroux is really blossoming, and I think Nate, Nate Hinton will too. And with their size in the backcourt, back it makes Houston a much bigger team than they were last season. But one thing that amazes me about Houston, they had a plus 7.2 rebound margin. Uh, so they out-rebounded their opponents by 7.2 per game. 
that was eighth in the country and first in the AAC. To me, that's absolutely unbelievable because if you looked at Houston's roster last season, it went like six foot, six one, six three, six seven, six eight. That was their starting five. The guards were small. Like I said, the three guards were six foot, six one, six three. Their wing was six three. Well, this year you're talking like six five, six five, six six. Uh, Jero, the point guard, will be six five. You have Grimes, who will be kind of the combo guard. He'll be on ball sometimes, off ball sometimes. He's 6'5". And Nate Hinton's 6'5", 6'6"-ish. I think he might be 6'6". I think he'll play the wing along with Cedric Alley. You could put Cedric Alley at the wing or at the small actual you know, forward position, which gives Kelvin Sampson a lot of flexibility. And then just like last year, you're going 6'7 and 6'8 at the forwards. You lost Brayon Brady a 6'8 forward, but you're gaining Justin Gorham, who sat out last year. He's a transfer from Towson, and he averaged 10 and 7 two years ago at Towson. And everything I've been hearing about Justin Gorham is he's a ferocious rebounder. And I know Kelvin Sampson is really high on him and really likes him. I've read articles and interviews where he's talked about him. So if he averaged 10 and 7 two years ago at Towson, that's better than Brayon Brady averaged last year. Uh, I thought Brady was a good player. He was a good defender. He was good at drawing charges and, uh, you know, taking up space in the lane. But he only averaged 6 points, 4 rebounds. I think Justin Gorham could easily um, surpass that. And he may not even start. You may start Fabian White and Bryson Gresham at the two forward spots. Again, 6'7 and 6'8, just like they had last year. Bryson Gresham, uh, he transferred along with uh, Dejan Giroux from UMass. Both, both were recruited by UMass in 2016. Um, like I said, Giroux was a top 50 recruit. Bryson Gresham, was a, uh, he was number 172 overall three-star. So not bad, not bad. Um, a 6'8 forward. And, you know, they came together to Houston. They both you know, sat a year and uh, both played last season. So they've been in the system a while. They can both have big breakout years. So the point being, even though they the whole backcourt is, you know, left and they're replacing the entire backcourt, um, Nate Hinton and Dejan Giroux did play quality minutes last season. And they actually even have more upside than the people that they're replacing from last year. Now, uh, uh, Corey Davis, Galen Robinson, Armani Brooks, the three guards they had last season, they did a tremendous job for Houston last year. They were good three-point shooters. They didn't turn the ball over. Uh, Galen Robinson was a good assist guy. But these three in the backcourt have more athletic upside. They're taller. Uh, they just, the ceiling is higher than last year. The floor may be lower because the team's younger, uh, they may not be as consistent as they were last year. Houston was unbelievably consistent. They played well every game. Like I said, even, even in the loss to Kentucky in the Sweet 16, that game was there for the taking. It was either team's game with a minute to go. Kentucky just made a big shot that basically won the game for them down the stretch. But this team has a higher ceiling. It, it may not be have as high a floor when the season starts right away, but I still think they'll be fine you know, from the get-go, it definitely has a higher ceiling. I think, I think Quentin Grimes will play well this year. And like I said, I think Dejon Giroux and Nate Hinton are probably upgrades over, you know, Brooks and Galen Robinson. I, especially Dejon Giroux. I'd rather have a 6'5", top 50 point guard than a 6-foot point guard who I think came from junior college who wasn't even ranked. Not to say he wasn't good. He was very good at Houston. Like I said, I, I love this Houston team. I loved them last year. What Samson's doing is phenomenal. Uh, I, I'm a big fan. I haven't got a Houston hoodie yet, but that'll probably be the next one I buy on eBay because I do have futures. I'm telling you right now, the highest in town is 100 to 1. I have bet it. Uh, it could go higher. It, Houston could go higher, but I like it at 100 to 1 simply because of the backcourt. It's a taller team than last year. Like I said, it's, it's not tall up front. It, they're actually small in terms of height up front. 
But that didn't stop them from being one of the best rebounding teams in the country last season, which is amazing to me. So overall, they're taller. You still have Chris Harris, who's the one true center on this team, a 6'10 center. He came off the bench last year. He'll come off the bench again this year. It, it just gives Sampson more flexibility. Now if you need a shot blocker, a rim protector, you have that in Harris. His big liability is he's an absolutely terrible free throw shooter, one of the worst in the entire country. But on the defensive end, he's a huge asset in terms of uh, rim protection and blocking shots. That's the one weakness Houston has in general. When you're running a bunch of 6'5 to 6'8 guys out on the floor, you don't have a lot of rim protection and a lot of shot blocking. But... These guys have long wingspans, they're quick, they're athletic, they get a lot of steals, you know, um, they can cut off passing lanes, they, they know where to go. Like, Kelvin Sampson can really coach defense. They know where they need to be, they know what spots on the floor they need to be at when the ball gets there. Uh, I have no doubt they're going to be an elite defensive team. Uh, so let's just finish out the roster. Cedric Alley probably won't start, but he's going to be an invaluable piece. He's a 6'6 wing. He could play that third guard spot, that wing spot. I think he can also play the small forward spot if need be. And then uh, the rest of the forwards, you have Juwan Roberts, who's a 6'7 freshman. Another 6'7 guy. Samson can play and plug along with Fabian White, Bryson Gresham. And I already talked about Justin Gorham, another 6'8, 6'7, 6'8 forward. The Towson transfer who... Did a really good job two years ago at Towson. So the front court is deeper and better than last season. And you still have Chris Harris who could play center. The only question mark I have with this team is depth at guard. I think the backcourt is going to be fantastic. But all you really have for depth at guard is Caleb Mills, a 6'3 redshirt freshman, who the, I know Samson and the coaching staff are very high on. He might actually be their best three-point shooter. So... It's another reason I like this team so much. If you need instant offense, if you need someone to come and knock down a three-point shot or stretch the defense, that's what Caleb Mills is going to be in there for. Uh, like I said, 6'3", redshirt freshman. He's been in the system for a year. Um, he might be their best three-point shooter. And then you have a... The only other depth you have at guard is Marcus Sasser, who's a 6'1", true freshman, part of this recruiting class. Basically, this recruiting class was Sasser and Jawan Roberts. They're the two true freshmen on, the, on this team. Uh, Caleb Mills is a redshirt freshman. So depth at guard is really the only issue. If one of those three guards were to go down with an injury, you could, you could have some worries there at the guard spot. But as long as they stay healthy, uh, Houston can easily go 10 deep, possibly 11 deep. And uh, I, I think they're a very, very underrated team this season. A couple more numbers on Houston, just in case I haven't convinced you how good I think they could be. Their scoring offense last season was 75.3. The scoring defense was 61.0. They, they had a points per game average of plus 14.3. That was one of the highest in the country. Um, their scoring defense of 61.0 was 7th in the nation, 1st in the conference. I already told you about their rebounding margin. Their field goal defense... This shocked me when I looked this up. I would have thought field goal defense, Virginia, was number one in the country. Houston's field goal defense last year was 36.8. It was number one in the nation. It was better than Virginia. Now, granted, they don't play in as strong a conference as Virginia. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about this team. I'm Because I don't think there's going to be any drop-off on the defensive end. I think as long as... They're a decent three-point shooting team. I think if Grimes and Caleb Mills and, you know, Giroux and Hinton can hit threes, that might be their, my biggest concern is, is three-point shooting on the offensive side. But I don't think they're going to lose a step in the rebounding or defensive department, and it's going to make Houston a tough out night in and night out. I have them number two in the AAC behind Memphis, but I think it's close. And I actually like Houston's backcourt over Memphis. Uh, I'll talk about Memphis more in an upcoming video. I just think ha Memphis has so much more size. I'll give them a slight edge, but I would not be shocked at all if Houston won the AAC. And again, like I said, I need to get a hoodie because if if we find higher than 100 to 1 odds on Houston, I'll, I'll definitely be getting down more, more and more jaw jaw on the Cougars. So anyway, that's it. Um, we did number 22, 21, and 20 today. I'm going to do 19 through 16 tomorrow will be my next video. 
Uh, I have to knock them out uh, three, four, or five at a time so I can get this all done by the time the season starts. Uh, if you got anything out of this video, please hit the subscribe button and like this video. Um, you know, I post college football or college vi uh, uh, basketball videos throughout the season, and some of them might even make you some money. So stay tuned, subscribe to the channel, and uh, let, let me know if you have any questions or ideas about videos that you want made. Uh, please comment in the comment section. Feel free to agree or disagree with anything I said in this video, or if there's anything I missed, I'm all about learning. The more you learn, the more knowledge you have. You, the smarter you are, the better decisions you can make. And being that I live in Las Vegas and I bet these for a living, it's, it's important that I make smart decisions. So if there's anything you can let me know, if you're a Houston fan or a Texas Tech fan, and, and there's a player who might have a star breakout season that I'm missing, that coaches are high on, you know, let me know. Or let me know why I might be wrong about Texas Tech, why I should be higher on them and I'm not. But anyway, that's it for this video. Thanks again for watching. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon.